From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiger and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here. In 1980, Lawrence of Arabia composer Marie Jarre landed on Shogun's first TV appearance for NBC with an epic score of Symphonic West meeting centuries-old wind and string east. Forty-four years later, the alternative musical trio of Atticus Ross, Leopold Ross, and protege Nick Chuba have arrived at FX's distinctly different, far more graphically realized land of feudal Japan in a way that re-Christians James Clavell's book for utmost commanding realism. Yet the one element that comes from a uniquely alien world is Shogun's reconceptualized score. Working for two and a half years with Japanese arranger Taro Ishida to capture beyond authentic instruments from Japan's Edo period, the Rosses and Chuba have put these ethnic sounds through a transfixing, often menacing atmosphere to let us hear with Anjin San what it's truly like to be a stranger in a strange land, all while calling on the kind of alternative rock rhythms that have distinguished Leopold and Nick's collaborations on such shows as Dr. Death, the Girl from Plainview, and Black Mirror. The result is a soundtrack that captures the percussive politics and battles of dueling samurai warlords and the eerie exoticism of a culture based as much on lethal protocol as poetic beauty, all making this shogun a hypnotic musical fever dream where ancient Japan is a state of the experimental senses. And now here are two composers who have taken the sound of samurais back to the musical future. Let's welcome to Film Music Live, Leopold Ross and Nick Chuba. Hello. Well, it's great to have you here. I mean, I was one of those uh, kids who watched Shogun on its original debut on NBC, and I'm just really just astonished by the, this new version with really its own musical identity. I mean, had you watched the original before being given this reconceptualization of the show? Uh, I think we were, we were a little bit wary of watching the original just because we didn't want to be influenced either way. Um, like we didn't want to either be influenced to do something similar or to be, to do something dissimilar. So we kind of took the decision to um, just not watch it, basically. How about you, Nick? Had you ever seen the original miniseries? I, I never, I didn't watch it either. I read the book, which I really liked um, in preparation for the show, but I had the same thinking of trying to not be too influenced or put yourself in a box by watching the the original miniseries. You know, the thing I guess that really just grabbed me automatically was how strange this the show was. It literally could almost seem like science fiction about the spaceship traveler who's just totally thrown into an alien planet. And the score really captures that this completely weird sense of a stranger in a strange land with Anjin Sun. Was that always the goal? Uh, <clears throat> setting up the whole musical tone of, uh, of the approach. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely, particularly in episodes one and two, we intentionally wanted the audience to feel the kind of same sense of unease and wonder that the crew of the Erasmus feel, because as you rightly point out, this is the period equivalent of crash landing on an alien planet. Like none of these guys thought that J the J Japan existed, um, yet they've washed up ashore. So we wanted to make sure that the music that you hear in those initial episodes is essentially no, not melodic. Like we have a lot of character themes um, in the show, but the arc of the score kind of 
delays bringing those in until later in in the show and makes sure that we kind of set the tone of um alienation i think in those first couple of episodes would you agree nick yeah i think we definitely were looking for something where the viewer would feel uncomfortable and out of their comfort zone when they're landing on you know the alien planet um and i think when we were initially getting some of our japanese recordings our goal was to manipulate them into something that sounded vaguely acoustic and familiar but had a science fiction sort of flavor to them as well so that was definitely baked into the the score obviously you had i think nine months before you even started scoring two picture what was that period of research like and especially in getting the indigenous japanese authentic sounds into the music i think it was really vital in some ways to allow us the time to experiment um and we we were in fairly consistent contact with justin marks the showrunner um during that time while they were shooting um and we would send bits and pieces you know we had sort of <clears throat> amongst ourselves atticus nick and i had sort of conceptualized a broad idea of what we thought might be cool and then we started sketching out ideas which we would send to justin during that period and he would give us feedback um and that would allow us kind of give us confidence to push further into that into the realm that we were exploring um so yeah i think that period of time sort of allowed us the space to discover the language of of the score yeah and and you know it was nine months until we saw any footage but then i'd say another year and a half of time after that before we were even really finishing up or mixing the score. So we had like over two years to really delve into all this new material that we were collecting. So I think the time was a huge, huge part of it. So please send in your questions for uh, Leopold and Nick. And we've got one from Yakov, which is since most of the show is subtitled and I imagine you were scoring it with subtitles baked in, did that change your approach to the natural rhythms and beats you hit within a scene? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, the funny thing about Shogun is a lot of the uh, music is really about psychology and it's kind of about scoring what's going on in the character's head rather than what's coming out of their mouth. You know what I mean? Like often those two things are pretty opposite. <laughs> so, um, so yeah um yeah, and, it, yeah. well there's also happened. oh sorry i was just gonna no, say no, a no. lot of their clever like i what i love about how they use the subtitles is that what you're reading and what they're saying and what america is maybe translating to blackthorn but what we've read is often changed or made the tone of it is different to serve her own interests or their own interests and i think deciding to score which one of those you're choosing to score and whose perspective you're scoring was was something that was fun to play with. Now, we've got a question from Aaron Cruz, which goes into your general work. Um, I loved what you and Atticus did on the Black Mirror episode, Crocodile. Have you ever had the opportunity to work together, I guess as a foursome, with Atticus and Trent? And if so, how was that experience? And to further that question, how did your work process work on Shogun with Atticus? um uh i i mean i've been working with atticus literally since i was 12 year old 12 years old that's no exaggeration so <laughs> we have a long history of working together and it's sort of difficult to describe at this point because it's so uh what's the word it's so intuitive we've been doing it so long that we don't really need to talk to each other <laughs> <laughs> but um 
Uh, no, I've never worked with him and Trent. Um, and in regards to how we went about the Shogun score, I mean, as I alluded to uh, a little bit on the last question, we sort of, we had a sort of idea about how we could uh, potentially record um, period Japanese instruments and kind of bring them a little bit into our own aesthetic in a way that we thought would be interesting. So we kind of initially discussed that amongst ourselves and then went off and, <clears throat> and each sketched out a few ideas, which we then sort of put into a pot. And then from there kind of each would pull out those ideas and further develop each other's ideas. If you see what I'm saying, I don't know if I'm describing it. Am I describing it well? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we have like a, a shared Dropbox with what we call writing stems, which are just all the instruments on their own. And we could pick and choose from that and maybe collage or start a new idea based on something else someone else started or um, build a new version of a track. So it's very, it's pretty organic. And I think just over time where you start to develop the language of the show. Nick, how did you fall in with this gang? And what was your Pilgrim's progress like to this point? <laughs> um, I uh, was in college and um, uh, so my friend knew Atticus and I was just looking to get out of school and work. And I was not having a great time at school at the time. So I had met met with Atticus just in a casual way and then just sort of emailed him seeing if he needed someone to clean the studio for free basically and after a while he relented and let me come in a couple days a week and then from there he he hired me when I graduated and I've been there ever since basically so So we've got a question from Geek Guy, uh, and he'd like to know what is the best note a director has given you when creating a score. I love this. Genius! Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, a lot, a lot of the time when you are working in episodic TV, it's actually the showrunner that you're mainly having that kind of creative conversation with, I guess, because on a show you've got 10 different directors and it's just difficult to develop a shorthand with a director and then have a different director on the next episode. So for the most part, we're, we're dealing with the showrunner. Um, Justin, who was the showrunner of Shogun was great in the sense that he wanted to push for something unique as much as we did. You know what I mean? I think oftentimes you might work with people who, when you encounter different types of scenes, they might check out. They might be like, oh, this is an action scene, so whatever. You know, I mean, I'm not saying they use those words, but you get the sense that people are sort of like might check out on certain scenes where Justin really wasn't that guy. He was very adamant that every aspect, every type of scene, um, every approach was intentional and thought out. Um, so I don't know that that's that hasn't really answered his question, but <laughs> well, I would say I would say in relation to that, there was a po point when we were doing episode one where there was a lot more music in the show, and then one of the it was less of a nitpicky type note, but an overall note was that there was just generally too much music, and that we could be much more selective when the music takes place, and it's much more intentional. And I think that is a good note because it's not that's placing an importance on the score and it's not just background music. You're really only using it when it's really adding something to the story. So that'd be one thing. 
I really love uh, Tornaga's uh, character. He's kind of inscrutable, but again, it, you know, there's this whole kind of like fifth, fourth level, fifth level chess that this character is playing uh, with the situation. Uh, tell me about playing Tornaga. Uh, with Tornaga, we, <clears throat> you know, like as you mentioned, he's five steps ahead of everybody else at all times. So we wanted to kind of land a melodic theme that sort of captured his gravitas, so to speak. Um, and we ended up, well, we sketched something out initially uh, using so, uh, fairly electronic sounds, but we ended up using um, a Japanese instrument called the, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, it's Kokyu, K-O-K-Y-U, Kokyu. Uh, which is a bowed string instrument. And that's the only time you hear that instrument in the score is in Taranaga's theme. So it has a sort of um, pride of place, I suppose you could say. Now here's a question from Ivan Sorokin. Uh, John Barry once said that if you dropped authentic music into these locales, they don't work dramatically. Have you found balance in adding authentic instruments and sounds so it shouldn't sound stereotypical, as it were? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, we, our goal was never to make period Japanese music. What we were, what we were trying to do is use uh, instruments that were authentic to the period, but bring it into our own artistic aesthetic, and more importantly, create a singular sound for Shogun, a sound that matched the kind of exquisitely detailed and epic world that Justin and Rachel had, had created. What do you think, Nick? Yeah, I think um, I think that was one of the big challenges was making sure that it doesn't sound stereotypical or that we're just aping some music and just placing it there and making it our own thing. Um, and I think a lot of that came down to the research we were doing with Tarot and and then spending a lot of time with those initial recordings and being able to manipulate them in the computer and with hardware in a way that brought it into our sort of aesthetic palette and we could build instruments out of those new sounds and and use them to compose so the foundation is some of these recordings but then we've manipulated them into something that's uh you know unique and doesn't sound stereotypical now louis versalini would love to know over the two years that you spent developing the score did any of your ideas change or did you decide to go in a different direction once you were able to see the actual scenes uh i mean i think a lot of it changed i would say um but i think you could say that for for every show that that we work on that's definitely like <clears throat> the ideas are all fairly malleable and um i think that's the exciting thing about working on a show especially a, one like shogun where there was a bit more time than there were on other shows because there was a lot of visual effects which take a long time in post-production so um there was a little bit of, of additional time there for us to really kind of hone the sound and hone the themes uh and allow the themes to kind of develop from episode one so that they're different in episode 10 if you get what i'm saying um so yeah nick what changed for you when you saw the finished uh, thing i think uh yeah i mean a lot changed i mean the way they made it was more like a 10-hour movie so they weren't it wasn't like the typical schedule of doing a tv show where you you do them chronologically and it, it mixes every two weeks and you're just racing to hit that deadline like we were working on the main title we were still working on the main title when episode 10 was mixing so it was like there was all this time uh, you know as we're going and we're recording more instruments and discovering new 
palettes and stuff where you could then like if we're on episode six maybe and we've found this new sound that we really like we could then go back and put it in episode one or you know vice versa so um i think it was just a it was just great to have all that uh extra time to be able to really think about what the sound of the show would be you know no i have to give out a shout to love and mercy which i think is one of the really one of the most lovely musical biopics I've ever seen. And also Bill Poland's new film, Beam and Wild, is amazing. And that brings us to a question from Dale. What are some of the things you can share about your process working with Atticus on the mashups and the other edits of the Beach Boy multitracks for Love and Mercy? I think that was the first project you did with us, wasn't it, Nick? Yeah. 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 That was right when Nick first uh, came on board with us. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, <clears throat> in regards to Love and Mercy, um, it was really Atticus. Atticus had an incredible idea, I think, which was essentially to use um, the Beach Boys uh, recordings and create a kind of collage um, of what was going on in Brian's head. And that was the sort of Genesis idea. And then the fact that Bill was able to procure the tapes for us was incredible. Um, and just having those is somewhat of an honor. <laughs> um, but I would, I mean, I remember just being stunned by the amount of material there was. I mean, they sent us like drives and drives and drives and drives of, of material. And these were like recordings of the recording sessions, like multiple takes of God only knows, like there was so much stuff. I mean, every song had multiple takes, et cetera, et cetera. So like that was a real undertaking of <clears throat> having to be somewhat organized in terms of like listening doing a lot of listening and taking out little pieces and and putting it together um and sewing them back together in a kind of different way but it's one of the projects i'm most proud of because i think the result was something incredibly unique um and i think that it interwove with the songs really well and made the story play that much better than if it had been a case of oh here's a beach boy song and now here's a little orchestral score piece and now we're back to a beach boy song i think that it made it made it a seamless experience as a viewer which i think was amazing nick what was that experience like um i i mean it was pretty cool i mean we got my at the time my main duty was just going through a lot of the drives and chopping out little bits that could be useful to Atticus and Leo to uh turn into a, the collage so we would I would go through and find sometimes they'd be like tuning a guitar or like someone would be practicing their horn part and you could just isolate that because most of their recordings you know we had the stems but stems in the 60s is like basically two tracks is like the room and the drums or something. So we were, you know, I thought it was really exciting and I was just glad to be a part of it. Now in Shogun, I absolutely love your scoring for Mar Mariko. And again, there's a crossover there as well for you, Leopold, in the same actresses in Monarch. What was that dichotomy like? Uh, it was kind of amazing to see, you know, I, I was lucky enough to score Monarch Legacy of Monsters as well as Shogun. So I was kind of working on them at a similar time. Um, and it was amazing to see this actress who I personally wasn't familiar with before give such strong performances in both shows, but also such different performances in both shows. So my hat goes off to her. I think that she is clearly a very talented actress. 
Yeah, I mean, and no offense at all to the beautiful Yukio Shimada, you know, from the original, but this is a definitely, I think, a much more. Sorry, there was a loud motorbike going past. I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> That's part of the red rain that we'll see tonight. <laughs> yeah, as part of the uh, castle attack. Uh, but what was it? You know, again, Mariko was su such a, a, definitely a much stronger character in, in this version of the show, of Shogun. Yeah. What do you think, Nick? Yeah. Um, well, I, I haven't seen the original, so I don't know her portrayal, <laughs> but um, I I think to me, when I read the book, she she's she's definitely, uh, you know, very contemplative and in a similar way as the book. Um, and I thought her performance was amazing. I mean, it's it makes your job so much easier when someone's doing all the heavy lifting emotionally like that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing again that makes us so different, it's essentially Game of Thrones meets Shogun in terms of just, again, the politics, because half of the show is, what's it like playing political maneuvering? Um, it's a lot of fun. I mean, there's a, there was an opportunity to do fun stuff. Uh, for example, um, Ishido, who is the... Uh, regent, the member of the Council of Regents, who is, uh, he has a lot of ambition, but he doesn't have the finesse of Toronaga and he never will. So he, in some ways, becomes a slight comedic relief in the show. So it was, it was fun to kind of play the two dynamics of Toronaga being this, you know, master chess guy, five steps ahead of everyone else, and then Ishido being a guy who sort of thinks he's ahead of the game, where in fact he's clearly not. So we ended up um, repurposing Toronaga's theme um, and playing it on rubber bands to underscore Ishido, um, because we felt that um, when we were listening to a lot of the uh, stringed in instruments that they used in the period like the biwa and the shamisen there's uh not a lot of decay when they're plucking the strings and that's something that the rubber band has in common with that if you if you pluck a rubber band it doesn't have a lot of decay either so we kind of strung up a synthesizer with rubber bands and then played um an iteration of toronaga's theme for shida so uh, for our last question, um, you know, new episodes on tonight. I can't wait to see the big castle siege. Um, what do you think that you as composers have accomplished with the show? How do you think it's taken you to the next level? Well, uh, well, for me, I feel like uh, working with, with Tara was really cool. Because, I mean, usually when, when I or we start a project, I'll buy a lot of gear and guitar pedals or synthesizers. And I think this time we put a lot of the energy into finding cool people to work with. Um, and I think that, you know, is something I want to take going forward and doing research on every project and finding interesting people to, you know, help bring something new to the palette. Yeah, I mean, I think that now that we're at this stage of Shogun coming out and um, obviously the reception that it's received has really been beyond expectations, but um, I think we've started to realize like what a special project it was, you know, just to be involved, just to be asked to be involved was, you know, something that didn't really hit us at the time when we were asked but now looking back at the journey we went through it and looking back at the opportunity we had to work with taro ishida to find all these different instruments to kind of record uh buddhist monks in their temple in japan like there were so many amazing things that we were able to do on this on this score which was kind of it feels a bit once in a lifetime. So I'm very thankful to have that. 
Well, Leopold and Nick, I want to thank you so much for joining us at Phil Music Live. I want you all to watch Shogun on FX and Hulu with Atticus, Leopold, and Nick's score available on Hollywood Records. A big thanks to Ray Costa and Sam DeFrank at Costa Communications and Lillian Matulik and Brittany Rendeck at Disney. And thanks to our designer, Mark Northam, producer Dale Turner, and executive producer, Mark Northam. And I'll be seeing you on the next Phil Music Live on Monday, April 8th for Mike Post's Musical Vision of America. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Bye.